So my name is Raghav Trivedi, and I'm the specialist commercial law pupil barrister at St. Philip's Chambers. Um, the aim of this talk is to provide a summary overview of the applications for security for costs, this being a type of application that falls within uh, band two of the type of work that could still be undertaken during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you might have seen that there was a release by the uh, HM Courts and Tribunal Service on the 6th of April, um, setting out the listing priorities. The elements uh, to this seminar as follows. I will provide a roadmap overview of security for costs, um, what, what it all is about, its purpose, uh, the procedural requirements when making an application, the relevant gateways under which an application should be made, the overarching judicial, uh, judicial discretion available to a court uh, when uh, exercising uh, or trying to create a uh, move forward making an order in respect of security for costs, and how to draft an order in respect of the, uh, this application. So the general rule, as you all will be aware, is that the question of who pays costs is not determined until the claim is finally disposed of. And as you'll be aware, the unsuccessful party bears the burden of paying the costs of the successful party. However, there has to be an exception to that general rule, especially where there is, as set out on screen, a significant risk of defendants suffering some form of injustice or having to defend proceedings with no real prospect of being able to recover costs if they are ultimately successful. So there has to be a method by which um, those costs can be secured by way of a protected fund to enable the recovery of costs in the event of success. The mechanism that I'll be looking at which enables this is CPR part two to part 25, and in particular rules 25.12 to 25.13. Those mechanisms provide for a gateway and a wide discretion available to a judge to make such an order. However, as I've put at the bottom of the screen, there are other mechanisms available to a court when considering an application for security for costs. Um, for example, an, an enactment may permit the court to require security for costs, or the provisions within CPR 3, the court's general case management powers, may be utilized for that purpose. Indeed, even the summary judgment provisions provide for security for costs, where the respondent's case may succeed, but it will be improbable that it will do so that is set out within the practice direction to part 24. However, I'm focusing my attention to rule 25.12 to 25.13 for two reasons. Firstly, at the junior end of the bar, these are the provisions that come up more often than not. And secondly, given the length of this particular seminar, um, it's prudent that we focus our attention on these provisions as opposed to looking superficially at all of the provisions. So in terms of procedure, the approach is to use the usual part 23 application form uh, N244. However, there is a form uh, called PF43, which sets out the contents of what is required within an application notice and the written evidence in support. And I set out at rule 25.12.2, any application for security for costs must be supported by written evidence. So form PF43 in brief, sets out that the claimant gives security for the defendant's costs of these proceedings or up to a specified stage of those proceedings in a specified sum. It allows for um, uh, asking the court for a stay on proceedings until security is given. And if security is not given, there is provision for an unless order to be imposed as well upon a claimant. Um, so if, if the claimant breaches that order, um, judgment, uh, the claim be struck out and judgment be entered on behalf of a defendant. PF 43 also sets out that any written evidence and support must show one, that it is just to make the order, and two, that in all the circumstances of the case, it is appropriate to, uh, the one, sorry, one of the conditions applies to, uh, applies to the case as well. Let's check the Q&A screen just to make sure there's no teething problems. Um, it's perfectly fine. So in addition to that, there also has to be provided a draft statement of costs, which should be filed with the application notice itself. 
The Commercial Courts Guide makes clear that the first application should normally be made at the first case management conference and that the evidence should deal with the location of the claimant's assets and any practical difficulties there may be in enforcing an order for costs. These provisions are not appropriate for the small claims track given the limits to the recovery of those costs and indeed I believe rule 27 Point two one a of the CPR makes clear that actually the small claims track doesn't uh, security for cost provisions do not apply to the small claims track. Rule twenty five point twelve states that a defendant to any claim may apply under this section of this part for security for his costs of the proceedings. Note that it only applies to a defendant to any claim and therefore a pre-action application is not possible. But in effect, what this means is, is that in respect of an application for security for costs, this can only be made by a party in the position of a defendant against a party in the position of a claimant. But this would obviously therefore cover part 20 counterclaims as well for additional third party claims. CPR rule 25.13.1 states that the court may make an order for security of the cost if satisfied having regard to all the circumstances of the case that it is just to make the order and one or more of the conditions or gateways as set out on screen applies. So practitioners must bear in mind two questions. Firstly, whether one of the conditions for uh, granted security for cost is satisfied, i.e. the gateways on screen, and having regard to all the circumstances of the case, it would be just to make the order, i.e. The, the general judicial discretion. My focus as set out on screen is on condition A, C and G. The reason being, again, these are the ones that we see more frequently in court. And given the length of this seminar, it's appropriate to focus on those because they have produced a body of case law. So focusing upon gateway A, this is a situation I set out where the claimant is resident outside of the jurisdiction, but not resident in one of those contracting states. Burden of proof is upon an applicant to show that the respondent is outside of the jurisdiction, which is a question of fact and degree. And what the court is looking at here is the claimant's habitual or normal residence, as opposed to its temporary or occasional residence. It's worth noting as well that the reason why there isn't a gateway B, as you may have seen, is because A has now incorporated both A and B uh, in the sense that where the residence outside the jurisdiction provision applies, it applies to both individuals and companies. And when we're looking at companies, residence is defined as where the company's central control and management is. And that, that is set out in the authority of Olympian Each Ways Limited of 1995 1 WLR 560. And that even if there are assets within a convention state, but the resident is outside of the jurisdiction, security for costs can still be awarded. Now, Gateway A is a ground that really relates to the obstacles or the burden of enforcement of an or a subsequent order for costs. So what the court there is looking at is, is there any financial difficulties uh, now upon a respondent, uh, sorry, an applicant, um, given the fact that the, the claimant is resident abroad. So those are the facts to take into account. The position where there is a foreign and English co-claimant is that the court can still make an order for security for costs. The question there will be whether it's likely that an order for costs will be fully enforceable against the claimant within the jurisdiction or whether the claimant has funds within the jurisdiction to meet liabilities for costs. And the position when considering foreign claimants with property in England is that the, it's, the question is whether the claimant has assets within the jurisdiction and the fixity and permanence of those assets. It's not the court's job here to infer a risk of dissipation of those assets unless there is reason to question the probity of the claimant and thereafter the character of the property as well. Is that property easily realizable or easily transportable? And those are the evidential points to bear in mind when considering gateway A. 
Moving on to gateway C, this is known as the impecuniosity ground and applies where the claim to the company or other body incorporated inside or outside Great Britain and there is reason to believe that it will be unable to pay the defense costs if ordered to do so. This applies to limited companies registered under the Companies Act, unlimited companies, and even companies with a single member or other corporations. The defendant has the burden of proof to show that the claimant company will be unable to pay any costs that may ultimately be awarded in the defendant's favor. And that proof that the company is in liquidation or is insolvent is on the face of it evidence that it will be unable to pay any cost order. However, where a liquidator or receiver brings proceedings in name of an insolvent company, it's not under any duty to ensure the company has sufficient assets to pay any costs awarded to the claimant, sorry, the defendant. In that situation, the defendant has to make an application for security for costs, and there'll be no uh, cost order made uh, that personally attaches to the liquidator or the receiver. Note on gateway C, that the question is whether there is reason to believe that the claim, uh, claimant company will be unable to pay the defendant's costs. In essence, this is a watered down burden of proof. It's not to show on a balance of probabilities that that is the case, but simply the provision of credible evidence of an inability to pay will be sufficient. And that question is determined at the time of the application, but also looking into the future, what is the position of the claimant likely to be at the end of trial? In a way, therefore, the court does apply the usual insolvency test, the balance sheet insolvency test or the cash flow insolvency test to determine that question. Moving on to uh, gateway G, I set out on screen. This is a uh, situation where the claimant has taken steps in relation to assets, making it more difficult to enforce an order for costs against him. Here, the defendant is not required to show what steps were taken with a specific intention of defeating enforcement, but simply that steps were taken. However, if there is evidence to show an intention, that will obviously assist the court in showing why an order for security for costs should be made. For example, that could be in the form of dishonesty in the past or evasiveness in the proceedings. In effect, these principles are very similar to the ones that are applied to freezing injunction applications. The, there is an additional point to take into account, and that is the taking of steps in relation to assets that will hinder enforcement. Once the court has determined that the application falls under one of those gateways, there is an overarching judicial discretion available to, to a judge in making an order. The court must consider whether it is just in all the circumstances to make an order for security for costs. The key principles derived from the authority of Sir Lindsay Parkinson and Co in Tripland are set out on screen. And Lord Denning set out those following factors. The key factors that we see cropping up in court more often than not are the ones in bold, namely whether the claimant's claim has a reasonable, good, reasonably good prospect of success whether the application stifles a genuine claim, or whether there is delay in making the application. When considering prospects of success, there's a tricky balance to achieve here. The test is one that is very similar to the one applied in summary judgment applications. And similarly, it's not the court's function to conduct a mini trial. The evidence has to point one way or the other if the merits are to be considered. In particular, um, Vice Chancellor Brian Wilkinson stated in Paul's Lack and Paul's Lack, 1987, 1WLR 420, that I deplore the attempts to go into the merits of the case unless it can clearly be demonstrated one way or another that there is a high degree of probability of success or failure. Therefore, the evidence has to be clear that the applicant or the respondent is likely to succeed and that will merit the consideration um, of prospects of success. In considering the stifling of a genuine claim, if the claim is one where the court feels that there should uh, security should be ordered, 
it can fix the amount of that security at a level that will not stifle the claim. Here the court is looking at the ability of a claimant in raising funds by other means, whether that's through friends, relatives, and if it is a company, its directors, shareholders, or other interested individuals. However, that knowledge is obviously in the claimant's hands alone. So it's for the claimant to show that it would be prevented from continuing the litigation for a reason of a security for costs order. I do apologize, another screen popped up. When considering delay, The fact that delay is one of the factors to take into account in any event shows that it is important to make an application as early as possible. Delay may deprive a claimant of time to collect security. They may act to their detriment in some way, shape or form as a result of the delay, or simply it will cause a claimant some form of hardship in the future conduct of litigation. And what the court can do is reduce the amount of security to reflect this or limit costs to future costs alone and not incurred costs. So as, as you can see, the court has a wide discretion in the way in which it approaches those factors on screen and indeed in making a decision on the amount of security. A recent authority of Tugashev and Orlov, as set out at the bottom of the screen, provides guiding principles um, when considering the amount of security. And in short, High Court Deputy Judge Eggers QC, you heard that case, stated that there is a broad brush approach to be undertaken in assessing the quantum of security for costs. But the sum must not exceed that which goes beyond what may reasonably be expected to be recovered by a defendant in the event the claim is ordered to pay the defendant's costs. So here the court is taking into account the nature of the litigation or the stage of the litigation to which the proposed security relates what the litigation entails in terms of the provision of legal services, the production of factual and expert evidence, and other costs and disbursements. Indeed, the court approaches the task of assessing what is the appropriate amount of security by the usual principles that are applied at the end of a case when assessing costs, namely whether it is reasonably and proportionately incurred and reasonable and proportionate in amount and the usual proportionality factors in CPR 44 are taken into account. So overall, the quantification of security is an objective assessment based on the available evidence and information. It is not akin to a detailed assessment, but similar to a summary assessment or a cost budgeting exercise. The, the judge in uh, Tugashev made very clear that where a sufficiently detailed breakdown of costs is provided at an application, then any doubt would be resolved in favor of an applicant. But where such uh, detail is not provided, then that doubt would favor the respondent, making it crucial that the written evidence and support uh, attaches a statement of costs. The judge also stated that allowances will be made for reduction in costs, which would normally be made at the end of a case when costs are assessed, usually on the standard basis. As stated, but where there is a real possibility of an indemnity cost order being made against a claimant, that is something to take into account. The question isn't whether uh, an indemnity uh, basis assessment is appropriate, but that there, whether there is a realistic possibility of such an assessment being ordered. And on the whole, it's for the applicant to satisfy the court that the amount to be ordered in respect of the security accords with the guidance the judge gave in that case. Finally, when considering an or, uh, the actual order for security costs, CPR 25.123 states, as on screen, that it's for the court to determine the amount of security and direct the manner and time within which security must be given. The relevant form to consider is form PF44, which sets out a draft order. The contents of such are very similar to the uh, contents which must be included within an application notice, 
namely that the claimant do give security for the defendant's costs up to a certain stage of the proceedings in a certain amount. And more often than not, the funds go into the court funds office. However, it's set out on screen. The reasonable alternatives include bonds and guarantees or even solicitors' undertakings. The draft order makes provision for a stay to be imposed until security is given. And the unless order provisions, such that if there is a breach of the order, uh, the claimant's claim can be struck out and a judgment ended for the defendant. However, the commercial court's guide uh, makes reference to an undertaking and damages to be provided by an applicant. This is not a mandatory requirement, but it's something that the court may take into account to protect the respondent in the event that it's found that a security for cost order should not have been made and some prejudice has fallen upon the respondent as a result. Further to that, the court, commercial court's guide makes clear that instead of a stay, it may be more appropriate to provide time for provision of security with liberty to apply for dismissal of the, of the claim in the event of default. What's also important is, and this derives from the authority of Radu in Houston, 2006 Court of Appeal decision, that in respect of unless orders, it may not be appropriate in every case to impose an unless order, given that it is not to, the security for cost provisions are not to be used as a weapon by a defendant to obtain speedy summary judgment. Therefore, the unless order provisions may be more appropriate when considering the more serious types of cases, for example, where a claimant has hidden assets abroad or some dishonesty is shown on the part of, uh, of a claimant which warrants an, uh, an order to be made for security for costs. In those instances, it may be appropriate to make an unless order uh, or incorporate an unless order within the security for costs order. As with many, most orders, they, they can reflect the circumstances of, the, of each case. So as you can see, applications for security for costs under CPR 25.12 and 13 require the consideration of a number of factors and components. As I touched upon earlier, there are a number of other mechanisms um, by which an order for security for costs can be made, in particular the court's case management powers in the CPR 3. However, usually in those situations, the, the factors and considerations that I have discussed are taken to, into account as well. And hopefully I've provided a summary overview of the main elements for the frequently applied mechanism of CPR 25.12 and CPR 25.13. That will assist you all going forwards. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, feel free to drop a message in the Q&A or um, get in touch with me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to assist. Um, the aim will be to provide uh, a LinkedIn article or an article on Chambers' website um, answering the most popular questions as a result. So feel free to drop, drop those messages accordingly. Thank you.